You're listening to an archived Cabral Concept podcast. After listening to this show, check out the most up-to-date podcasts available at stephencabral.com slash podcasts or search directly on iTunes. And now, welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Thank you so much for joining me today on this Training Thursday, where the topic today is the 10 signs you're in danger of overtraining or you are overtrained. This is such an important topic that I would say not only do we not talk about it, we even promote overtraining as a culture in general, meaning that the harder the workout, the better. The more workouts per week, the better. The more you feel like you're just crushed, you know, lying on the ground after you work out, well, that's a sign of a great workout. The truth really couldn't be further from that. And the reason is this, is that every once in a while to get in one of those, you know, really intense workouts, fantastic. But that is literally not how the human body was set up to move. We do not expend massive amounts of energy and then hope to recuperate incredibly quickly and then do it again the next day. That would not be a normal hunter-gatherer or human-based response. So what we want to look at is I love exercise. I really do. I mean, I've always loved exercise. And growing up, I was always into sports, loved sports. When I was in high school, I played sports. College, I was recovering from whatever that illness I had was, right? That mystery-based illness. But I still really got into weightlifting. So I think weightlifting was one of those things. I honestly believe that around 18 years old, I started to get into it and It was about six months after I initially got really sick. I feel that it was one of those things that helped save me, that during that time when I couldn't play sports, when I couldn't be as cardiovascularly active, meaning that I couldn't go running, I couldn't do any of those things, that I could go to the gym and I could lift with some buddies, we could have a good time, we could blow off some stress, and I could start to change what my body looked like. So although on the inside, I was not healthy, I wasn't, right? I would get pneumonia and sinus infections every winter. My body was chronically fatigued, all of those things. When I was in the gym and I was exercising and I was with my friends, all of those things, I felt great. I really believe if I didn't have that to look forward to four or five days a week, hanging out with, you know, my workout partner, I remember back in college, especially my junior, senior year was, was a guy named Jesse, but I worked out all through my senior year of high school. And then also later in college, we would work out as a bunch of guys in my, uh, my dorm freshman, sophomore year. And I had the greatest uh, group of friends that freshman, sophomore year, especially there was like 40 of us all on one floor. And we, we seemed to go everywhere together. And that was a lot of fun. So I believe exercise should be a great outlet in terms of releasing stress. It's just one of the best ways to do that. We've obviously seen the clinical data in terms of depression. If you have low mood or depression, and you're not exercising, I would honestly say daily, first thing in the morning to get your body going, you're missing out on all of those benefits. So no one's a bigger proponent of exercise than me. I just think that in this Western-based thought mentality, we take things way too far. And what happens is we start to break down our bodies and it can lead to these 10 things that I'm about to discuss right now. So let's get right into them. I'll be throwing in some different notes along the way. But the first one that I want to start with, and this is an easy one, like this is a really easy sign that people can look at. Now, if you're a personal trainer or a health coach, you can also look at this in your clients. And if this is you assessing your own physical body, if the weights start to feel heavier, or if you're a cardio-based person and your legs start to feel like lead, it's a sure sign you need a little bit of time off. You need more time off. I'll give you some recommendations at the end after I go through the 10 signs. But what happens is you're starting to become overtrained. They call this overreaching. You've been doing too much for too long without enough rest or your nutrition is lacking. For all of these things of overtraining, it could be your nutrition as well. That's for sure. If you're not getting enough proteins, carbs, and fat, and yes, I said carbohydrates, if you're on a strictly keto-based diet and you've been on it for a while and you're suffering because of the lack of carbohydrates, that could be an issue as well. So, and I'm talking about keto as in really low carbs, below 50 grams a day, and you've been on it for quite some time. I'm not talking about cyclical keto, which I think is totally fine. And I'm not talking about a longer overnight fast. And I'm not talking about 
doing a keto based diet for like two or three weeks. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking like four months into keto, you know? So here's the thing. If your body starts feeling like you have to just consciously think about lugging it around, and I know what that's like. I used to be honestly so exhausted. And this wasn't just from overtraining, obviously, exercise wise. This was from Addison's disease and, and something called myelagic encephalomyelitis, which is essentially like walking around with the flu every day of your life. I had to think about putting every foot in front of the other. I literally thought about every step I took. And I was so tired, sometimes sitting down at the table at night with my family, that I would have to literally think about speaking. Like I would have to think about forming the words. That's next level exhaustion. What I'm talking about is like when your body starts to feel just so heavy, it's a sign you may be overtrained. All right. Number two is that you don't have the same interest in your workouts. Well, you know, for one thing, I kind of laugh at this and especially when, because I, what I wanted to do today was kind of give you my top 10. And so I just make a bullet list of my top 10. Well, my number two was you don't have the same interest in workouts but you know the truth is that a lot of people don't like working out in the first place. So I would say less of an interest, meaning like, oh, you, you just dread going to the gym that day. And you dread going to the gym, not because you don't like the workout, but because you're so tired thinking about actually having to get in there and move your body. That's a sure sign too, that you're becoming overtrained, that you're not following the proper nutrition, the proper sleep, the proper exercise. And so at the end, again, I'm going to talk about the sleep, the exercise, all of those things increased inflammation. So in general, like if you're just starting to feel more inflamed, meaning like you, okay, one day it's your knees that are bothering you. And the next day it's your elbows. And then your shoulders or neck start to feel tight. And then, you know, it might be the, uh, the biceps that are sore. So if you are just pushing it too hard and there's not enough off days from meaning like there's not enough, um, undulating off days. And again, we'll, we'll chat about that. And that can lead to over inflammation. And then in the long term, that inflammation can actually turn into injuries, meaning that if the muscles aren't recuperating, if they don't have enough time to recuperate, it can lead to injuries. So if you feel like you're starting to get injured or you're starting to get nagging injuries, they're not like full-blown injuries, but maybe it's something like a shin splint or it's um, tight hamstrings that almost feel like they're a little pulled or a little too many micro tears in them. Those are signs that you need a little bit more rest or you may need just an unloading week. You may need to turn down the intensity. So let me go over this one right now. This is really important. A lot of people in their programs it's all hard all the time. And what really matters is that you're doing four to six weeks of gradual ramping up of your workout. And then you take one lighter week where it's just an unloading week. When you start a new program, okay, you start four weeks, let's say, of the same program. This is what we do at my um, studio in Boston. Four weeks of the same program. And then the fifth week is the start of a new program, okay? And it's two out of three sets or it's lighter weights for the same volume. But what it does is it gets you acclimated to a new set of exercises. That's smart, right? There's no need to go all out. You're just acclimating that first week anyways. You still might even be a little sore, which means you don't need to overdo it because they're new exercises. And then you ramp back up weeks five, six, seven, eight, okay? And then the next week, week nine, is a new workout. Start to a, a set of four new weeks for that new workout, and it's an unloading week again. And then you ramp back up. You kind of peak out that fifth or fourth week, and then you switch up again. That's just one example but it works really well and it saves our clients from becoming overtrained and injured. And that's, that's the most important thing, obviously, is that you stay in the game, right? You can't get injured. So really important right there. Number four, number four is you're getting sick a lot more often. And this is an interesting one, but what would happen to me? And again, like I just learned all of this through trial and error. I honestly, I wish all of this information was available in mass, you know, back in the day, right? So again, because we didn't have the internet, like it wasn't, it was dial up internet and that was just a pain to get on. And then it, the information wasn't even as great. So what happened was, again, I'm reading books, but um, I was not able to read with the same speed back then either. So as I'm going through all this, there wasn't these things like, oh, if you're getting sick, you might be working your body too hard because the, just the data wasn't there. In the last 20 years, the spreading of data has just been monumental. And so there's just been increase in really good books, really good articles, because everybody's learning from everybody. Well, had I known back then that why I was getting sick so often, I would just relapse every two, three weeks, is I was just running my body down even more. And what happens is, and a lot of people don't know this, that overexercise actually suppresses the immune system, okay? It can give it a boost. It can really, it really can give it a boost, okay? If you have just, say, like a head cold, not a chest cold, but a head cold. You could do a sauna or you could do a light exercise. And it's a light exercise because if you push yourself too much, well, then you actually suppress the immune system more. So I'm always a little cautious on this. If you're feeling really sick, skip the gym. 
do a sauna or just get some rest, do an Epsom salt bath or whatever you want. But what happens is, again, I've talked about this before, I'll continue to talk about it, a J curve with exercise. Really great results until you start to hit the bottom and then come back up the other side. When you push it for too long, usually for most people over 40 minutes, over 45 minutes, what happens is you are depleting your body. You're becoming more catabolic, which I'm going to be talking about more about in a moment. When that happens, your body's breaking down faster than it builds up. Same goes for immune-based repair. Over-inflammation, over-immunity right there, okay? Inflammation is a sign of an immune system, not dysfunction, an immune system function. Your body's going to repair a certain site of the body. Or with over-exercise, a lot of times, it's an overstimulation of the entire body and nervous system. People don't believe and understand that the nervous system can become inflamed. So that leads me to my next one as well. So again, if you're getting sick a lot more often, or just sick in general, one is you could be lacking all of the nutrients that help to build your body up. And again, I'll, I'll keep mentioning this every single podcast if I have to, but it's glutamine, it's zinc, it's vitamin C, and then certainly your B vitamins, okay? Those are the things that your body needs just right off the bat to repair. If you are lacking zinc, vitamin C, glutamine, and your B vitamins, going to be really hard to deal with stress. It honestly is. So it's, it's one of the simple things that I recommend. If you do something like the daily nutritional support shake, okay, I'm just giving that as an example. If you have your own favorite, then fantastic. But look in the back. It has essentially 50 milligrams of all your B vitamins. So most people don't need to take an extra B. If you take an extra B, I recommend the active B vitamin. And the reason I recommend that, it has a little less natural folate because you're already getting that from your shake, but it gives you another 50 milligrams. So we have people take that at breakfast or at lunch if they're particularly stressed or they're working out hard or they don't have a lot of energy, right? So then that helps give them a huge boost. It's a phenomenal thing and I, and I use it all the time myself. So that's a big, big boost. And then you can take extra vitamin C. Honestly, extra vitamin C is going to be good for most of us. Why do I believe that? Because I'm a clinician, which doesn't mean anything fantastic, right? All it means is that I practice an active clinical practice. So what does that mean? Well, I see lab data every single day. The lab data tells me that nine out of 10 people are functionally deficient on vitamin C. What does that mean? Well, go back to last Friday, the last Friday review, okay? I talked about that on functional deficiencies. That was episode 777, which means that you're not going to have scurvy, right? You're not so low in vitamin C that your teeth are literally falling out. That would be tragic. That's not a good thing. But you're so low in vitamin C that your immune system isn't functioning as it should. And your hair, your skin, your nails, they're all starting to age at a faster rate. So for most people... A little extra vitamin C goes a long way. How much do I recommend? Somewhere between two and three grams per day for most people, like if they're hard trainers, like if they're exercising. And you can just do it upon waking. You can use one scoop of the alkalizing vitamin C or your favorite vitamin C. I like the alkalizing vitamin C a lot for people that are exercising and training because it has alkaline-based buffers. So meaning it has the magnesium, potassium, and calcium. And those are going to be alkaline buffers. So if you're producing a lot of acidity in the body, which everyone does when they exercise. Some people are just better buffers than other, meaning like the pitta body type and def the kapha as well, but pitta body type for sure is great at, at a alkaline buffering system. Uh, the vata body type, the ectomorph, not, not so much. So I need, you know, I need more of those alkaline based buffers myself. That's why I like that one. But again, a lot of vitamin C just in general, great, great product. How do you know if you take too much vitamin C? Well, you get loose stool. And so that's an easy sign that you're taking in too much vitamin C. And then zinc, most people will get enough in something like their activated multivitamin, their daily nutritional support shake, whatever they're doing, somewhere between 15 and 30 milligrams per day for adults. Pretty good dosage. We do have people go up to 50 milligrams per day that are more catabolic, okay? They need a little bit more repair. We do that for about two to three months, especially if they have high copper on their hair tissue mineral analysis. And then we just give the recommendation two to three months, then we come back off the, the uh, zinc and just get it from your nutrition-based shake. Super simple, but it works amazing. These are simple things you can do. Remember, I'm not making any of this up, honestly. Like This is all from functional medicine, orthomolecular medicine, all these brilliant minds such as Linus Pauling and Dr. Andrew Saul and all these just great people who have done the research. They're PhDs in this. They look in the lab. Then someone like myself takes it into clinical practice. And I say, is this working? So how do I know if it's working? Well, I see the person's lab beforehand. I put them on this specific protocol. Then I retest the labs later and they're all better. And so I know that it works and they feel great. Like that's, and I did it for myself, of course. That's why I'm trying to pass this on to others is because I know it worked for me and I'm trying to pass it on obviously to others. So, okay, number five, number five out of 10 is a change in mood. Again, 
I didn't recognize this for so many years. I didn't recognize this, to be honest, about five years ago, which I, I should have known better. But sometimes I become a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more irritable. And when that happens, I'm like, what's going on here? And it can be that I just didn't get a good night's sleep. That for one, like I need to get my sleep. That's for sure. You can ask my wife about that. But you know, the other, the other big thing is that if I'm training too hard and not getting the sleep and not getting the proper nutrition, because I might be dieting, I, I don't do that anymore. But like back in the day, I would do photo shoots and things like that. And oh man, I would become much more irritable. And that's kind of like an industry thing as well. Talk to anyone that's doing a photo shoot or any of these things and they're lowering their carbs. They just become a lot more irritable for sure. So that's one just to keep an eye on. You know, if you notice it, not just one day, but if it's happening over a week, something to look at. Are you pushing yourself too hard? And that next level to that is really becoming more apathetic, right? That apathy or low mood or even depression. That's the next level after the irritability and the, you know, I would even say anxiety and the aggressiveness then becomes low mood and depression. Now, this can happen. There's multiple sides to this. So one is that you've just pushed yourself for too long and your body is just depleted, right? It's depleted of neurotransmitters such as dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, GABA. This does happen because you have to understand your B vitamins like B6 and your glutamine, all of these things downstream, they're going to either convert, be cofactors, or turn into your neurotransmitters. Extremely important to understand this because our body doesn't make those feel-good neurotransmitters, the happy neurotransmitters, without precursors to them. And the precursor of the things that I just spoke about, there are many others as well. So a good functioning body does not have these issues. That's why if you are low mood, you're apathetic, you're depressed, my job is to just show you that I'm okay if you need the medication in the short term. Remember, I'm here to support you however you need it. And I say that every day in my practice. But what I want for you in the long run is not to have to rely on those medications, because I know that they just don't work as well a year or two years later. I've seen the research. I've studied it. And what I want for you is to always get to that underlying root cause. So you need the exercise because it will help to pull you out of the depression along with a lot of other things, right? A lot of other things. Great book called Nutrient Power. I've, I'll talk about that more in the future. I did a quick overview of it in February with my 25 book review there. But here's the deal. You need exercise, you just can't overdo it, especially when you're in that low mood. So I highly recommend exercise, highly recommend, even if you just get an exercise bike or you just start with literally walking. Tune back into a previous show. If you're new to exercising, tune back into a previous podcast. It was titled something like How to Ramp Up Your Workouts. So go to check that out because I actually teach you, if you're a beginner, how to start with walking, what to do after walking, then how to progress, how to progress, how to progress. So you don't progress too fast. Because for the most part, it's unnecessary. All right, the next sign that you are overtraining, all right, the signal that your body's giving you is that you are waking up during the middle of the night or you can't turn it off at night. Okay, so two things. Basically, insomnia, right? You're not able to sleep that well. But if you can't turn it off at night, your workout might have been too close to bed. That's one. So the cortisol levels are still high. Melatonin is not being produced. How can you change that? Well, you can use something like our deep sleep package which is the liquid melatonin, the magnesium citrate, because it gets into the body a little faster than the magnesium glycinate or lysinate to be able to be used right away. And you can use something like the Best Rest Formula. Cortisol Manager is a great product or phosphylserine to help knock down cortisol levels at night. Really great for brain-based health as well. And then of course, CBD oil works incredibly well too. So there are a lot of things that you can use to get yourself to sleep. We're able to help anybody with insomnia. I don't care who you are. We're able to help you with that because I know all the different mechanisms uh, again, I've studied them. I didn't. I, when I say I know, I learned them from the brilliant people, and I'm able to implement them in my practice, and, and obviously see it works. With now having worked, done a, over a quarter million client appointments, we just have so much data. So I like to be able to help people with those issues. Myself, as a former insomniac, I really believe I went through many, many of these issues. I don't know. I just feel like I went through it so that I would one day be able to help people. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not true. I like to look at it that way. Keeps me happier. <laughs> knowing that um, I had to go through all this myself, knowing that hopefully one day I'd be able to, to help others. So anyway, I like to look at it that way. But if you're also waking up between like the 10 and 2 hour, you have to keep in mind, this is the pitta based hour in Ayurvedic medicine. And I talked about the Ayurvedic sleep cycle on a previous podcast. Check that one out as well. Because the Ayurvedic sleep cycle shows that 10 and 2 is transformation. It's repair. It's the pitta part. So if your body's working really hard, meaning like your nervous system is just ramped, and your hormones are trying to keep up. And so here's the deal. Between 10 and 2, thyroid's working hard. TSH is actually peaking out somewhere around midnight. 
your body needs that time of the night. So if you're not in bed by 10 p.m., you're not doing things correctly. You're honestly not. I've talked about this before, about this night owl thing. Why don't I, I'm going to do a show on that too, because a lot of people don't understand this. I'm going to type in the night owl thing right now in my notes, because that's a show that I'll actually look forward to, uh, to doing as well. So here's the deal. If you're waking up between that hour, I do recommend using some of the sleep-based things I spoke about and then calming down your training, all right? Calming down that training because your nervous system is too ramped up. Your body's a little too catabolic. It's having to do too much repair during that hour and it's waking you back up. Okay, delayed onset muscle soreness, DOMS. My buddies and I used to throw this around all the time in almost like a negative way. If we weren't sore for like two or three days after our workout, we were like, okay, workout wasn't hard enough. That is not the mentality you want. That was my college mentality, right? And so what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're definitely not sore for 72 hours after your workout. Now, that first week, let's say you're super sore for three days. Well, you know that that's the maximum amount of work that you need to do. So what does that mean? Well, the next week when you go to do that workout, you don't need to add more. Because if you're still sore for a day or two afterwards, well, your body already trained hard enough. Like, what do you need to do? Like, you don't need to do any more muscle breakdown because delayed onset muscle soreness comes from all of the tissue breakdown. It also comes from inflammation. It comes from lactic clearing. It comes from calcium clearing. It comes from all these things that your body's doing. But the bottom line is that it's a repair-based mechanism happening. I like to feel the next day that I had worked out, but I don't want to be super sore. So the bottom line is that I know a lot of people like to make sure they felt the workout from the day before. I'm okay with that as long as you aren't sore for multiple days in a row, okay? Not extended muscle soreness. I don't think that that's a great thing, especially, you know, trying to mimic what I used to do back in the day, whereas if you couldn't, if you literally could walk down the stairs the next day, then you didn't train your legs hard enough. It was one of those, you know, macho type things. You do not want that. In the long run, that's not smart training. All right, number nine, didn't know this till even a couple of years ago. And this is one of those things that I want health practitioners to know as well. Everyone in general, again, this, this show is for everyone. If someone in your family has like an unquenchable thirst or you know they're always reaching for something because they're super, super thirsty, your body could be in a catabolic state. This is what I did not know at 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. I used to drink so much fluid, but no matter what, like my mother was horrified. I've, I've talked about this story before. I would take a big like 16 to 20 ounce glass chug it down. I would grab another one, chug it down and do it a third time. Like that should make anybody sick, but my body could not get enough water. Okay. Here's the thing though. One is I, they didn't know it at the time, but my blood sugar was off. So that was a big issue. Meaning like I couldn't regulate blood sugar. I would get very, very low. And then after taking in sugar, like just normal carbs, I couldn't get my blood sugar back down. So that's why when they tested me, I had type two diabetes. I no longer have type two diabetes. That was a hormonal based issue as well. But here's the other thing. My body was so catabolic. I went in high school, I weighed 155 pounds, we'll say. I went down to less than 130 pounds when I got really, really sick. My body was literally breaking down its own muscle tissue, its own protein as a fuel source. When that happens and you have protein being broken down, your water needs go incredibly high. So if you're on a high protein diet, you actually need to take in a lot more water. And the reason is that your kidneys need that. Like they absolutely need a lot of water on a high protein diet. So here's the deal. If you find your thirst going way up, yes, it could be maybe a change the season, you're sweaty more, all of those things. But the truth is you could be overtraining. And if you're overtraining, the weights are feeling heavier, the sleep's not there, you're becoming more irritable and you have increased thirst, watch out. You need to take some time off give your body more nutrients, give your body some carbs, it's okay, and then let your body refuel. Honestly, it's more important that you're in this for the long run than you know just getting a couple great workouts in. I, just, I worry about people in this new mentality that I've seen happen over the last two, three years. All right, the last one I want to give you is this. Know your resting heart rate. I've spoken about this before, but know your resting heart rate. Take it in the morning, okay? Especially on, not on off workout days, you didn't work out the day before. What is it that morning? It should be in the 50s or 60s for the most part, all right? 50s or 60s. If you wake up and your heart rate's in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, or maybe even higher, it is a sign that your body is too ramped up. Your heart rate is beating as if you're going for a light jog. Like if your heart rate's in the 80s or 90s, you're already at a brisk walk to a light jog, okay? You want your heart rate relaxed. You want your body 
calm. A sign of a good calm body, not too ramped up, is a heart rate in the 50s or 60s, okay? That's what I look for in my practice. And this is super easy. You can literally get an oximeter, O-X-I-M-E-T-E-R, oximeter. And again, I've spoken about this before. Just So just go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. Type in any keyword you want. Type in ramp up to find that ramp up podcast. Type in oximeter to find out the oximeter, the one to test your heart rate. It's fine to test your own pulse. It just most people are off. I know a lot of people have an Apple watch, those types of things. That'll work too. But the oximeter is super easy. It will tell you how much oxygen you have in your blood. You want to be around a 98 or 99, ideally 99. And for this oximeter, it doesn't go to 100. And then you want to see your rest and heart rate. And again, you just want in the 50s and 60s upon waking. Super simple. Ideally, it's the same before bed as well. Two easy ways to check. That's what I recommend. And very, very easy to see these things. So those are the 10 signs you might be overdoing your workouts. You might be coming overtrained. And if you're experiencing any of these things, okay, simple. Here's how we're going to fix it. One is you can use my ideal workout week, which is pretty straightforward. It's essentially doing a day of like resistance-based training followed by a day of cardio or intervals and then a day off. Do it again. Resistance training, cardio or intervals, day off, okay? Your day off could even be Hatha yoga. It could be going for like a leisurely fun bike ride. It could be, you know, doing some Qigong or, you know, anything like that. Or it could just be going for a massage or doing your foam rolling or stretching, any of those things can be an off day if you're not someone that just likes to sit around. You can do that. But what you have to do is give your body time to recuperate. I'm going to be doing a show soon as well for people in their later 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 100s to how to modulate your workouts as you age. Because you should be doing the same exercises. You really should. But what you need to know more about is how to structure your workouts and also work on recovery. So there's a lot of different workout splits. I don't want the one that I just gave you right there to be the one, meaning like If you're an ectomorph, if you're a Vata body type trying to put on muscle, you could certainly do a Monday, Wednesday, Friday training workout or a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday where you're doing every other day and the days off are just literally for growth days. If you're an endomorph body type, a larger body type where you need to be really moving almost every day to keep your metabolism boosted, well, you could do a resistance training one, cardio on day two, resistance training two on day three, take a day off just to let the body recuperate and then go back at it for resistance training, then cardio, and then maybe a day off and just repeat like that. Those are all on my ideal workout week. You can download that by just going to the welcome package at stephencabral.com. We're going to be revamping all that in the future. I want to make that a lot more beneficial for you, just easier to use. These are all things that we have planned for you. So just stay tuned. I have an amazing, amazing team. I wouldn't be able to do this without them. But at the same time, there's so many things that we want to do. It's just like hard to keep up. I honestly wish we had like a dozen, two dozen more people and we'd be able to get all these things done faster. But you know, the truth is that you know, all of these things just take time. That's it. And so we have that time. For now, what I want you to do is if you're overtrained, I want you to get back on really good, healthy nutrition. I want to make sure you're not losing too much weight too fast. I want to make sure you take some time off, that you do some foam rolling, you do some stretching to relax the nervous system. I want you to get back into maybe an every other day routine to get back into it. Just watch your nutrition again. And then I want you to also get in the extra, like I said, the daily nutritional support shake, the alkalizing vitamin C, maybe an active B complex. Use the healthy gut support, which has the glutamine right in it if you want. Just do things for your body that nourishes it. That's it. Getting to bed a little bit earlier, using the the sleep protocol, the sleep package if you need to. You can test your hormones. You can test all of these things to actually see if you're overtrained. By doing the thyroid adrenal hormone test, you can do that. You can do a hair tissue mineral analysis, which is a little less expensive. That will show you if you're low in your electrolytes, low in your minerals. That means more depleted. So again, all these things are able to be tested. My job today, though, is to get you the information, see if you have any of these top 10 signs. And then if you do, either keep your workout program exactly the same, but don't push to that same level. Don't take everything to failure. You don't need to do that or start to modulate the workout so they start to ramp up over the period of four weeks and then an unloading week and then come back down and then ramp back up over four weeks. So hopefully this was helpful. I love doing the Training Thursday shows. Please let me know if you want me to do a follow-up. I'd be happy to do that. And if this show was helpful, please do feel free to share it with someone else. It may serve. Take care, everyone. Did you know that the body really only becomes sick or unbalanced in only two ways? Over time, you become deficient in vital nutrients and you also accumulate toxins internally and from the environment. 
As those nutrients diminish and you increase your total toxic load, your body then begins to show the first signs of dis-ease. It's actually quite predictable and the good news is that if we know how you began to fill up that proverbial rain barrel, we also know how to empty it to begin the healing process. I was fortunate enough to learn this ancient healing process from my mentor after suffering from debilitating diseases for close to a decade. It was only when I began to implement these techniques did I finally overcome my illnesses and go on to live a life of energy and vitality that I now enjoy. I'd like to share with you now what I discovered after traveling all over the world and how to combine the best of ancient healing wisdom with state-of-the-art science. Allow me to teach you exactly how I've been able to help over a quarter of a million people to empty their rain barrel and begin to transform their body and lives into what they've always hoped they could be. To get your copy of the international bestseller, The Rain Barrel Effect, simply go to stephencabral.com forward slash rain barrel.